Goedemiddag, beste kijkers. Vandaag praten we met James Steinberg. James Steinberg is een volgeling van Adida Samurai. Bekend als Dada Free John in het verleden. Uh, we gaan eens met hem praten en we gaan praten over spiritualiteit. Wat is dat? En waarom deze man de beloofde Godman is die hier op aarde is. James, welkom. Dank you. Oké. So, thank you. We just uh, explained a little bit to our viewers about the promised Godman. I would like to know, how do you see the promised Godman? How do you recognize a promised Godman? And what are his faculties? Sure. Well, in all the spiritual traditions, they talk about some being that's going to come, particularly when times are, are hard, difficult times. Uh, in Christianity, they always say this maybe about the millennium, you know, now it's going to be year 2000, and uh, maybe Christ is going to return, the second coming of Christ. In the Buddhist tradition, they talk about Maitreya. The Buddha of the future is Buddha Maitreya. And uh, in, in Hinduism, they talk about Kalki coming back. So everybody feels in some sense that if it's a very difficult time, then someone will come who knows the truth, who's established in the truth some being who can give us guidance. Um, Adidas is, is, is such a one. How do you recognize him? That's a very interesting question. Uh, when Jesus was around, only some recognized him. I and mean, look what they did with Jesus. So to recognize him requires a certain kind of sensitivity. Uh, and it's really not simply a mental sensitivity. It, it, it's a heart sensitivity to really be able to feel him. Uh, I've seen, I've been with Adida now since 1973, and I've seen over time, I've tested him, uh, I've checked it out in many, many, many different ways, and I've seen that he is who he says he is, that he is uh, a God-man, that he is what they call in the Hindu tradition an avatar, which means one who's come for the sake of giving to others and helping others, mm -hmm. rather than someone who's coming to work something out for himself. Uh, but to be able to recognize that, not everyone can at first. And myself personally, the first time I saw a picture of him, I was working in a spiritual bookstore in Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was one of the people who ordered books. And I saw a flyer for Adi Da. And he had sunglasses on. And he had this nice swept hair. And I said, those people in Los Angeles, that's where he was living, I said, they'll believe anything. Look who they think's a guru now. I didn't recognize him. He has a very full, round belly. It's called a yogic belly, a siddha belly. Some people see him, they say he's fat. They don't recognize him. The eyes are clouded over. So to really be able to see a spiritual being requires yourself uh, an openness in, in your heart. So let's, okay, so that is why you recognize him. Let's go back a little bit to your own personal history. You met him when you were 21 years old. How come that you went out for searching a teacher? What is your background? Mm. Well, I was raised uh, Jewish, uh, though my parents weren't particularly religious. I mean, it was more of a cultural matter. Uh, but for myself, I was looking for something that seemed more true. I kind of realized I, I was raised in a nice middle-class family, and I, I didn't think that money was going to make me happy. You know, I kind of realized that. Uh, I thought maybe the mind would make me happy. So I went to Harvard in, in the United States, Harvard University, and my professors weren't happy. Hmm? I was trying to see if the mind could make me happy. Um, that wasn't going to be it. Uh, maybe relationships could make me happy. You know, I had a very nice girlfriend, but I could see even in a relationship, even though we had a pretty good relationship, that that wasn't it. So I started looking for something spiritual something more eternal, something that was could uh, things would go good, things would go bad, but what was true besides all that? Adida talks about uh, spiritual sensitivities, and one is, a, is an intuition that there's something greater. Uh, the way he describes it is uh, that you're more than what you look like, not just your body, not just your mind, but there is this spirit. That's a great sensitivity. Everyone has moments where they feel that, where it kind of breaks through, uh, you could call it the mystery, uh, reality, something different you're aware of. The saints spend their whole lives focused on that. Most of us go about our regular life afterwards and that kind of moment recedes. Uh, 
So that's a great sensitivity. If you're aware there's, there, that there is happiness, eternal happiness. The other sensitivity is a sensitivity to this place, to know that this is a place where it doesn't always work out. Uh, it's not heaven here. Uh, in fact, uh, there's suffering everywhere. Whole tradition of Buddhism is founded on that sensitivity, the sensitivity that no matter how well it seems to be working out, even if it goes pretty good, you're going to die. The fact of death is a big thing here. Everybody is, tends to avoid the fact that they're going to die, but in fact we all are. Was it fear for you that you search for this everlasting quality in your life? Well, it's there's a certain kind of fear that comes when you really will take a hard look at uh, the fact that you're going to die. But even even then, the f going even beyond the fear, it's a sober understanding. It's a critical understanding. Uh, and it, if you get stuck in fear, then you can't even move. It's pretty hard even to look for a teacher if it's just fear. Some sense even deeper than that is an intuition, you know, a feeling that maybe there's something more than that, more than just that death, more than just uh, all that ordinary life is about. And based on those sensitivities, a sensitivity to your suffering and a, and a sensitivity to what's really happy and great, then you can find some other source, some teacher, some uh, truth, some way. And so at a very early age, uh, for myself, as I say, I finally came to Adi Dot 21, um, I was looking. Now, I checked out many different teachers. You know, this was the, the 60s, uh, and early 70s, and there were lots of spiritual teachers. It was kind of in vogue, uh, kind of even the, the fad at that point to have a spiritual teacher. So I looked at Buddhists, and I looked at Hindus, and I looked at some people who were Christians. As I say, I was raised a, a, a Jew, so I checked out some Hasidic Buddhism, and I met many, many good people. I only took an initiation and became a student when I came across Adi Da. And why was that? Because I read a book of his. It was uh, one of his very early books. It was called The Method of the Siddhas, The Method of the Great Teachers, The Realizers. And there was a chapter in there called Money, Food, and Sex. And when I read that, I said, this man can serve me. He knows how spirituality can be adapted to money, food, and sex. Because I was a Westerner. I was not going to avoid money, food, and sex. I wanted to be alive. I wanted to have all those things in life, but I wanted to do them from a spiritual perspective. When I came across Adida, I said, now here is a man who knows how I tick, how I operate, and this man can serve me. We talked a little bit uh, before we started the conversation about true and false masters. You told me that you came across many different teachers. Um, do you think it's an individual process that you find your teacher and someone else might be adapted to Buddhism? Mm -hmm. Well, I think ultimately, yes, uh, you have to respond to whoever is going to become your teacher. Yeah. And I think there are some teachers who aren't even true teachers. There are some people who haven't really realized as much as they might say that they've realized. But then putting that aside and just looking at real teachers altogether, then some people have uh, already connections. Uh, they're Christians and they want to be, be Christians. And then the advantage of someone like Adi Da, who has a wonderful teaching, is for anybody would be simply to study his teaching to maybe give them some more insights on their own tradition. But for anyone who hasn't found a teacher yet or hasn't found a true way, then Adi Da Samraj is available. And we call him, he calls himself the divine world teacher. You know, why a world teacher? Because everyone can take advantage of his teaching. Uh, his teaching speaks to everybody, black or white, man or woman, homosexual, or heterosexual, whatever persuasion or individuality, his teaching can address everyone. Can you tell us a little bit what his teaching are in speciality? Mm -hmm. Well, his, speeching, his teaching is that happiness is inherent. Happiness is our native condition and that all of our suffering comes from our activity of avoiding that happiness. Uh, his teaching could be really simply said as this, being this happy and radiant, or this, being contracted, turning away from it. And he says that the activity by which we turn away is like pinching ourselves. Like we're pinching ourselves, but we don't know that we're doing it, and we don't know how we're doing it. 
So his teaching teaches us just what we're doing to avoid relationship to the divine. And as soon as we see it, as soon as we understand it, we can let it go and come back to this. Talk a little bit about how do we do this pinching, this walking away from happiness. Mm -hmm. Well, we're in shock. We're in vital shock over against being born here and not knowing what this world is about, where we are, what the answers are. And so we assume separation. We d differentiate ourselves from others. The real condition Adiyah describes is one single divine reality. He describes that when he looks out, he sees God everywhere. He says he holds up his hand, and he sees God as his hand, but he sees God as the space around his hand too, only God. But the rest of us are all, well, there's me and there's you, so we're locked in this ego. The way he teaches is how to let go of this ego. And a lot of that comes through entering into a relationship with him. He's one who is always in this condition. And when we enter into a relationship with him, then we can enjoy this condition more and more ourselves. The advantage of a teacher and why a teacher is useful is because th through entering into a relationship with him, then you can always commune with what is free and happy. The other thing in his company is that he directly transmits. In his company there's a blessing force. It's very tangible. Uh, when you're in his company it's not like being with somebody else. It's a very, very special quality. Um, you can describe that uh, maybe so you could feel something like that if you go to a beautiful mountain. Or maybe you can feel something like that, uh, an orgasm, when you transcend yourself a little. When you come into his company, those kinds of feelings, well, it's even stronger than that. It's this tangible blessing force, transmitting force. And uh, when you enter into a relationship with him, you can feel that anywhere. Once you've established that relationship with him, you can be in your house in Amsterdam, and he can be around the world in Fiji, but that blessing force is felt as much as you turn to it. What questions me most of the time is that there are, I don't know how many billions of people on this world, and we're all divine beings in essence. Hmm? We are born with this divinity inside of us, or actually we are divine. So we have all these qualities, this negative, this positive, and all these patterns inside of us. So how is it for you in your understanding that there are only a few teachers on this world with these billions of people? You talked about shock at a moment. Can you go a little bit more in depth into the shock condition and why there are only a few teachers to help us human beings getting out of the condition we are in, so-called, in this bad condition. And why is that, according to you? Well, the world's a school. And there's many, many different people. The six billion people on this planet, many people are at different grades, you know? For some, this world is really about just making some money and surviving and getting a good, some good food, you know? Having a good relationship. For many, they have that. That's working okay. But they realize it's not enough. So they become interested in maybe doing some good for others or helping. For some who are even doing that, they realize that's not enough. And so they start to become interested in the more profound core of what this world is about, which is about the spiritual. Uh, so the world is not, it's not a negative place. It just provides many different opportunities for people to grow and advance. Uh, for those who are willing to take the hardest look, you know, who aren't going to be consoled or distracted, then they get involved in something that can actually help them transcend this place itself. Uh, they're willing to face that shock that we're all in. They're willing to look at it. You know, they don't want to just simply distract themselves. So much of the West right now is about finding ways to distract ourselves from that shock. Uh, we go to movies, we go to entertainments, there's sex, there's drugs. We do all these things to not have to feel what we feel like really at the core. The great spiritual teachers let us feel that. And they say, feel that all the way. Adi Das says, feel that all the way. And in feeling that all the way, what you really are doing, then you can transcend it. Then you can let it go. Why? Well, it's hard to say. The great question is even why is there anything at all? Why is there something existing rather than nothing? That great mystery, to contemplate that great mystery, is a, is a profound matter. Uh, and there is no real answer to the question. 
In realization, the question goes away, however. When you realize, there's no more questions. And so Adida says, that's why, rec that's why realization is, is recommended. There is a place. And he demonstrates that. Uh, in his company, he's radiantly happy. He laughs. And when he laughs, you laugh with him. You're drawn into that laughter because it's free. It's a freedom. Uh, one who's realized what's beyond. And that's what he, he offers. He draws people to. He says, the same condition that I'm in, you can realize it too. It requires a lot, but it can be realized by every man and woman. That this is your birthright if you'll take it. What did it require for you? personally? Well, what it requires ultimately is that this becomes the most important thing in your life. That you realize that the spirit is really more important. And yes, you still have a job. I have two children. I've had uh, many relationships and so forth. It has all been positive. But my principal priority has been about this divine matter, this truth matter, God matter. That's what required for me was for that to be the focus of my attention. Because I realized that that's where happiness lie, true happiness. And the ordinary things, that's good. And Adida does not have his devotees avoid that. We all live pretty ordinary lives in that sense. But our focus is on the divine. Our focus is on truth. How does his teachings go? Do you go once in a while to see him? Does he travel? Both of those. It's really wonderful to come into his company. Uh, they call it, in the Hindu traditions, they call it darshan. Um, when you know how it is, if, if you get in contact with a loving person, well, you feel love. If you get in contact with somebody who's really angry, well, it's kind of disturbing. When you come into the company of someone like Adi Da, who's always in that God condition, then you're brought into that. So it's a great and wonderful thing to do is to come into the company. In the tr traditions, they call it the most important thing. I mean, imagine what it would have been like to come into Jesus' company or to be in the company of the Buddha and what that would feel like. I mean, people still talking 2,000 years later about what it felt like to be around Jesus. Well, Adida, in my opinion, he's that same realizer. There's one realization. He's that same great realizer, except he's alive now. So the clothes he wears are modern clothes because he's alive in this, in this place. Uh, and his name, uh, Adida, the name Da means giver means one who gives. That's what Da means. And he's always blessing. Um, he has been to Europe. Uh, he was in Europe in 1986, and again he came in 1996. And he wants to come back and then grant this darshan, this blessing, to those who are ready for it, those who are uh, looking for that, those who want and need, understand the advantage of having a real teacher. You know, we know how important it is if you want to be a gymnast, you know, or a, a music player to have a great teacher. And we think somehow in spiritual terms that maybe we don't need a teacher. But really, if you look at it, if you really want to learn a lot and grow a lot and ultimately to realize the truth, then you need a great teacher too. How did it uh, work for you in the sense of a, a teacher? Because it's just what you said. We think we don't need a teacher, but we do need teachers in different ways. Eh? As you say, a gymnast or a swim teacher or whatever. So we need to be taught something. We need to be taught a map. How did this... Um, what would you say the teachings, how do, did those teaching in the years of 23 years helped you? Well, very specifically with each person, uh, there'll be something that you need to do that's particular to you. For example, for myself, I was somebody who was very good with my mind. I could use my mind all the time, so it was my best advantage, but it was also a disadvantage. It kept me away from feeling. So in my case, he's always served me with going beyond the mind. He's always told me, the mind's not it. At one point, I had so many books. I had a whole house full of books, and he told me that the after he had looked at me for a while, that the books were standing in my way. And so he had me donate all of our books to the library. And when I did that and just had a few books around, the ones I needed, I could go beyond this obsession with the mind. And it's different for each people. Some people, uh, he tells them to loosen up. Some people need to be more disciplined. When you have a teacher and a community, because we all live in community, so our friends help us too, and sometimes these things come from Adida personally, very often they come from the community of other practitioners, others who are, are also devotees. And they'll say to you, this is what you need to do. And each person is special and unique. 
Uh, but having a te teacher made it, has made a complete difference for me because otherwise you think you're doing something spiritual, but what you're really doing is in some sense a version of what you kind of want to do. So a living teacher has a great advantage that way. Besides from that, having a teacher, I can only tell you that I know really what the Divine or God is because of what Adida has shown me. Uh, I have been able to look in his eyes and see that there was no ego there. Uh, there was someone there who was free in the Divine, and that drew me out. I mean, I, I uh, have had that experience with him uh, enough times now that I'm convinced that it's not a matter, is there God or is there the Divine? There is, I'm sure. Uh, that freed me up greatly to know that the Divine exists, and I also know there's a way to realize that. And whether, how far or how mature I go is my choice. You know, how greatly I practice is my choice. But I've been very grateful that there is a teacher and a teaching that's true. You talk about practice. Does it involve certain techniques for you? Well, we don't tend to call them techniques because the whole idea of the search is undermined. If you're searching and trying as an ego, it doesn't work. But there are all sorts of things we do to help our practices, as you suggest. Uh, we, we do meditation. Uh, we sit together and, and chant and sing to the Divine. We eat good diets that uh, don't put toxins in our body to help us have more energy. We exercise. Uh, there's a whole range of things. We also do retreats. Uh, we drop out for sometimes, a few, sometimes just a day, sometimes for a week, sometimes every once in a while we ask people to take a month off and just dedicate all their time to that. Okay, let's come back for a little bit about meditation because meditation has become a worth. What is your understanding of this word? Mm. Well, there's so many different types and techniques and styles of meditation. The first thing Adi Das says is meditation begins when you already have a relationship to the Divine. That to meditate is no good if you're just in your mind. Mm. That you actually have to sit down and then enjoy and commune with the Divine. So meditation in our way starts first with establishing your relationship to the Divine which is ultimately your relationship to a God-man is the easiest way. So you first start and simply study his teaching. You don't even bother to meditate for a while until that feeling of God is actually clear in you, is established in you. And then meditation ultimately is sitting down and feeling that divine, putting aside some time every day where you don't have to do all sorts of outward-directed things and you can simply sit in that happy, enjoyable company. Usually, in our community, we meditate when we first get up in the morning. First thing to do before you get into all the busyness, and establish that feeling of the Divine in your heart. And then we often do it right before we go to bed as well, at the end of the day. And at first, we just meditate for a short time, just for a few minutes. And then as you grow and you become more adapted to the Spirit, then we lengthen that. And the establishment takes the whole day. Then, yeah, then, then you can stay in it uh, through the day. And then you can do your work and you can still have that feeling. Yeah. To be uh, you also, uh, f just for the viewers to explain what this is all about, uh, drop out, it means like a retreat? Mm. To drop out is a, re is a retreat and it's good to have some time in your life to do that. It's time for yourself really, for your spiritual practice, for what's true. Once a week we try to do that for one day. That's what we do on our Sundays. We try to drop out. And then once a year, for seven to ten days, we t that's, that's our vacation. There's still other vacations you could do and go someplace, and, but we have a real vacation. We try, to, we try to spend time for a week just doing a lot of meditation, a lot of study, a lot of allowing yourself that space in your life to really devote yourself to the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can, can I show you a couple things? Sure. This is a, a magazine that uh, is about Adida. It's called the Adida Revelation. And for people that are interested, we have a nice website. Uh, it's www.adidam.org. Adida is very aware that in this modern world, you need to have things like websites. Um, another thing I'd, I'd like to show you is this. I see here this. Yeah, I will s show it in in Dutch. It's called Samenwerking plus Verdraagzaamheid is Vrede. 
een universele wet tot herstel van de mondiale geestelijke gezondheid. En dit in Engels cooperation plus tolerance equals peace. Uh, many people aren't necessarily ready yet for spiritual life altogether, for full of fullest spiritual life for a teacher. But starting with the Kosovo crisis, Adidas had a lot of attention on the state of the world. Uh, he's been very clear that this is a very critical time for everybody. And that if the world doesn't really start to change a little bit, that we could head into a very bad spiral. And it's getting worse and worse. Uh, so what he's asked is that everybody in the world uh, adapt this, at least. At least understand that if they'll cooperate and tolerate, there will be peace. But if we won't cooperate and tolerate each other, then there'll be war. The understanding of cooperation. Yes. What well, cooperation means to allow each person to have and their views, however they are, and each person to respect that others can have their views. Mm. And, it's, and uh, sometimes you can work together. Mm. Sometimes you don't necessarily work together. And if you can't cooperate, then at least you can tolerate and allow others to, to do that as well. Um, he says that the root cause of war and conflict is this ego this self-contraction, in which you think over against everyone else that the only way for you to be happy is to be dominant over someone else or to win over someone else. And nations do that too. They feel like they have to dominate other nations instead of allowing the others. There is a little um, movie we're going to show to you, and it's about this little boy who asks a question about self-righteousness. Yeah, this is a film from a number of years ago, a video of Arida, and it gives an opportunity to see what it's like when he actually teaches and helps people. In this, he talks about the same cooperation and tolerance. Uh, he tells this little boy that he has to learn to love, and he makes it very practical for him. He makes it really easy for him to see how it's not just an idea, but how he does this in life with other people. And the little boy gets it finally. It takes a few minutes and he gets it and he's very grateful. He starts to laugh. He understands that he can do this cooperation and tolerance if he'll love. Mm -hmm. And the only way to, to help anybody else is to love them first. And that if you need to tell somebody else something and you need to maybe straighten them out a little bit, that you have to do it in the mood of love or they won't be able to receive it. So. Self-righteousness, is that something you be born with? Some people have more of that kind of quality, yeah, <laughs> and some people develop it. Huh? But whatever the quality, they're all to be given up or surrendered, and uh, that's why everybody's practice is, is special. Everyone's relationship to the divine is special. And even though we have this intuition, all of us, and have this spark or this understanding that we ourselves are divine, in each person's case, it requires a special way to practice to really make it strong to release all that. So if you're righteous all the time, you actually suffer it as much as others. Mm. You are withholding. Mm. And so even though you're angry at others, you're the one who's suffering it. So this little talk by Adida helps uh, uh, with this boy. And it's a good example of showing how he's, he teaches for, for everyone, how he helps everyone. Thank you for this talk. Yeah, my pleasure. We laten nu wat oudere beelden zien van de Gucira avatar Adida Love Ananda Samrais. Do you have a way that you can tell me that I can stop being righteous? <coughs> yes, if you love. Hmm? If you will love people and persist in that feeling. Allow yourself to love people all the time. then you won't be righteous. In the way that you're talking about, it's fine every now and then to tell somebody where they're at. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to be able to know the difference, you see, between behavior in, in a person that is tolerable, that should be allowed to be, that's all right, and things that people do that are not right, that are negative. But if you love them, then you'll be able to know the difference between the things they do that are good and the things that they do that are not good. And you'll be able to talk to them about the things that are not good without being righteous, without being angry, you see. 
you'll be able to be happy with them because you know at that moment that you love them too, you see. Whereas when you're being righteous, you're not aware of the fact that you love them, you see. You forget about that for a minute. Hmm? So you've got to learn about this loving, feeling. Whenever we don't love, you see, whenever we don't feel in this world, we start getting angry. As soon as we stop loving, we start getting angry. And then after we've been angry for a long time, we start getting afraid. We start to feel bad. So we've got to learn how to be able to love all the time, how to feel all the time. You've got to be able to feel the world. The lady who was just talking to me, was, she said she'd get up in the morning and she was unhappy about the fact that the world existed, you see. Well, that, that wasn't the mood of a devotee that she was in at that moment, you see. A devotee wakes up, and you know, even things may not be going too good. He feels God. He knows that God is all over this world, all inside the world, you see. Inside everyone. And outside everyone. But the world is about God. The world is about love. But the people here on television and people who are not being happy, you see, don't know that the world is about God. They don't know that the world is about love. That's why they don't love very much, you see. That's why they're always talking about themselves and about negative things. So if you're angry, you see, and righteous, it's just that you've forgotten for a moment that the world is about God. And the world is about love, and you are about love. So if you are all the time forgetting this, you see, you're going to be righteous. And there's nothing you can do about being righteous if you forget to love, you see. If you forget that the world is about God, if you forget me, then you're not going to be able to stop being righteous. You can't stop being righteous by trying not to be righteous. You'll stop being righteous when you forget about being righteous. Which means you've got to remember to love. What to remember to be happy. <laughs> I've written a book about this subject. <laughs> so if you want to be happy and not righteous and not angry, you've got to remember what you have to remember in order to be happy. You're all the time remembering what you have to remember to be angry and righteous. Well, that's not what you should remember. <laughs> You've got to remember what you have to remember in order to be happy, and that means you have, to be, you have to remember God. You have to remember the mystery in which you live. You have to remember to love. And you have to practice loving people. Not wait for it to just sort of happen. You have to practice loving people. And you have to communicate love to them. You have to say you love them. You have to do things for them that are full of feeling of love for them, you see. So you've got to find out what you have to remember to be happy. And do that. If you do that, then you will forget to be angry and righteous. And sometimes you may have something to say to somebody about something they're doing that's not very good. But it won't be the same as righteousness. You'll tell them this because you love them. And when you tell them, you'll even sound like you love them, you see. And there are even bad people here and there. <laughs> Who you can be very angry at sometimes. But you probably haven't met any really bad people lately. Really bad ones. And even really bad ones. <laughs> You see, are alive in the same world. They're, in, they're with God just like you, you see. Well, they've maybe got some things to learn, but you can't teach it to them without loving them. You can't teach anybody anything without being happy with them. Hmm? And you can't be happy with anybody else unless you are happy with them. You can't always wait for them to do something to make you happy, you see. You have got to make people happy. So this is what you should remember from our conversation. <laughs>